Hi friends and welcome to Costuming in Color. This is a YouTube show dedicated to showcasing amazing costumers of color and the people that support them. I'm Gigi, a history buff, historical costumer, and decalist. And I'm Noelle, a costumer who likes to play both sides of the historical and cosplay world. Today, we have the great pleasure of interviewing Chaney. Welcome to our show, Chaney. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm Chaney McKnight, a living historian, historical interpreter, and just all around dabbler in history. Yes, you all might know her from um, on Instagram. She's not your mama's history. And on YouTube, she is not your mama's history. And as of this recording, that YouTube is going off. Right. And I'm excited about it. <laughs> We're all excited. We're probably more excited than Chaney's excited. <laughs> yeah, probably. So before we get I think into I'm hiding from it. <laughs> before we get into it, let me give you our house rules. Basically, the first rule of costuming and color is that you tell everyone about costuming and color, right? Yes, this way, even those who don't have BIPOC in their local groups can get to know ones in our global community. The second rule is that kindness matters. Aside from that, there are no rules. So let's get into it. So Chaney, where are you from and do you still live there? I am originally from Atlanta. I'm a Grady baby. I was born and raised there and I no longer live in Atlanta, but it really shaped who I am because I was a high schooler in Atlanta, Georgia during the height of Atlanta rap and hip hop. So um, it was a great time to be a teenager in Atlanta. So, and, and you'll see it uh, come out in a lot of the dresses that I design. And I now live in uh, Brooklyn, New York. I've kind of jumped around quite a bit. What is your favorite thing about where you live? Um, my favorite thing has got to be the people. Um, I would say New York in general, we just have every type of person there is on earth. So um, from every corner of the earth, like there are, I study West African ethno-linguistic groups and I can find the most obscure, uh, tiny ethnic groups. There is somebody living in New York right now from one of those tiny ethnic groups. So it's just really awesome. Um, and I learned so much from my neighbors and uh, from all over the boroughs. And it's really great. And the history is just jam packed. I mean, uh, New York is just history on steroids. Mm -hmm. What is your Instagram handle and why did you choose it? <laughs> um, my Instagram handle is not your mama's history. I can't exactly remember the moment that I picked Not Your Mama's History. It started out as a Facebook group because I was trying to cleanse my personal Facebook group of um, neo-confederates. And so I started another, um, I was trying to cleanse my Facebook profile of neo-confederates. And so I cleansed I cleansed it and started a page so anyone and everyone could follow the work that I was doing. And then over time, it kind of evolved into something more. I think, obviously, I love my parents so much. <laughs> I am um, one of those people who are forever attached to their parents at the hip. Even though I live a very independent life, I live on my own and I still, I love my parents so much and we're just very close. Uh, so I think, obviously, I think my, I was thinking about my mom probably when I came up with the name, um, but I was like, it's not your mama's history. <laughs> I just thought it was very catchy. And um, everyone says I'm the queen at coming up with names for uh, companies as well as um, for shows and series. So I think that it all started with Not Your Mama's History. And so it ballooned from there. Uh, and now we have a website, we have a 
uh, Instagram, a Facebook, a, uh, a Twitter. And so it's, <laughs> and YouTube, obviously, yeah. It is a really catchy name. Like, as soon as I heard it, I remembered it forever. Like, people would, like, say, do you know Chaney? And I'm like, Chaney, and they're like, not your mom. And I'm like, yes, yes, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so good, good call on that one. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what living history opportunities are there where you live? Um, I think, so there are places nearby. Um, we have, I think, unique, especially within the city, we have unique experiences um, and it's evolving into more of, um, hey, let's go hang out. And so a little less like living history and a little bit more like, let's explore historical garments and, um, our place within the historical timeline together, maybe over some tea. Um, but then we, there are places more traditional living history sites. So we have um, historic Richmond Town on Staten Island. Then there is historic Hudson Valley. Um, they have quite a few sites still at sort of manner. So you will actively see um, African-American interpreters interpreting slavery in that, um, in the New York area. So it's, it's really rich here, but I really like, um, recently I've just been experimenting a lot with historical garments and, um, Afrofuturism and where I, where I am and taking myself kind of out of a place where I am perceived as less than, um, when I am in period, period, correct, if that's the thing, um, historical garb, um, and really kind of reimagining that to um, a place of power. That's awesome. I love the way you just stated that, actually. Um, taking it to a place of power, I. Can, can we just explore that for a second? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little more yeah. about that journey from where you started to taking this information to a place of power? Yeah. Um, I just, I guess when I started in living history, I should start from the beginning. So when I started, I got started through Black people, which I think small mercies, small mercies. Um, my middle school classmate, Marvin Alonzo Breer, um, got me into living history. Um, we went to the Gettysburg 150th. That was my very first e reenacting event. Um, from the get, I was a very, I was a little bit like, because there was a lot of, um, problematic, uh, interpretations, um, but I also met a lot of people who are just really open and willing to have conversations and um, look at different interpretations. And so um, I saw the potential of living history from that very first event. And I was like this, I want to be a part of this. And so from the rest, I guess, is history. Uh, when I came back from 150th Gettysburg, I wanted to participate. But Eventually I got really disillusioned with, um, with the purpose of living history. Um, and that I find that in order to justify doing it, a lot of people add a lot more meaning to it than it really has. And so I think that, that it can be a bit damaging if someone says, um, we have to do this civil war reenactment or this story will not get told. Um, and so I kind of saw some problematic aspects with that, but I said, um, how can we actually use living history to educate as many people as possible, uh, tell as broad a story as, as we possibly can, reach as many people as we possibly can, um, and I was like, aha, 
but um, I felt that it was uh, the rules, the living history reenacting rules were um, very confining. For example, you cannot, a lot of people during the time made a big deal out of you cannot wear historical garments outside of a living history event, like you have to, um, you can't use it for political reasons or to tell, connect anywhere with modern day politics. And um, I said, why not? Because I am a black woman um, and I am dressed as my ancestors who were who had limited agency and I decide to use um, these garments to actually make a, make a statement and make connections. And so it started from there and I think it kind of desensitized me to the, uh, to the rules, to the quote unquote rules of living history. And so once I broke that rule, then I started breaking other rules like uh, for example, you can only use period correct textiles to make historical garbs. And so um, I wanted to um, reimagine the future of my ancestors. So if they had unlimited resources and um, unlimited um, access to materials, what would they create? what would they want to wear? And so that's kind of um, when I started reimagining historical garb um, in the context of a Black American woman who grew up in Atlanta, Georgia in the 2000s. So you got the jean dress that I uh, designed and um, the mud cloth, which dress. Um, the mud dress. cloth 18th century dress I designed. So, um, and I collaborated with that with Jana, who is a um, clothing historian. And so I really like the aspect of bringing in these textiles that are very specific to me and my experience with like completely accurate construction, which I think is just, <laughs> I, I feel powerful. I feel very powerful uh, because I'm representing who I am and my ancestors at the same time. And I think it's, um, it's very specific. It's very specific to my experience. For people who want more than what we're showing on the screen right now, I will link uh, her Instagram down below for you, where there are very many examples of her breaking rules in this way. And they are extremely inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I, I still, I still um, do historically accurate garments. Um, it's just that I, I spend a lot more time, my self-care is to find myself within, um, within historical costuming, which I just never was able to connect with it. Um, even the, the more upper class things, or even uh, most of the things that I was wearing, which was the garments of working in slave field hands, um, in the 19th century, I connected with my ancestors, but I never really saw myself in them. It's a great way to make this sport your very own. So for your living history endeavors, what time period and place is your favorite? You touched a little bit on it, but what specific time period mm -hmm. is your favorite? So I would say I actually really love um, the 18th century um, just because I think, number one, I think the fashion is really, the lines are really beautiful. The clothing makes sense. Um, but also I think that 
it's a time, it's such a rich content as far as when we're talking about freedom and um, rights and revolution. And um, I, I like the messiness of the American Revolution because it is messy, because I would call um, the United States of America our hypocrites <laughs> because at the time of striving for our freedom, we were enslaving people. So um, it's very messy, but that makes for um, really great conversations that people can connect with. And um, I see a lot of the sources of our, uh, the sources of a lot of our problems in modern day America can be pointed back to this time period. Um, because if you have brought at the, at the base, so I just think all the way around, wonderful, um, wonderful opportunities to interpret many different things in many different places. Um, and even though a majority of Black people in America were enslaved during this time. Um, I think that it's a time where um, we were very present in the building of a country. Uh, so I really rejoice in um, those narratives uh, while still um, remembering uh, the, the very rough, painful, times that uh, Black Americans have gone through, especially 18th, 19th, 20th century, 21st century. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about how you started um, in costuming. How did you start as a living historian? Um, so I would say uh, professionally as a historical interpreter, I started in I think it was 2015, 2015, 2016. Um, I, I guess I, I had already started working in museums starting in 2013, but I really started to see as see historical interpretation as a real career um, by 2016, and so I went to work at Colonial Williamsburg and. Um, that really shaped a lot of how I looked at um, the profession as a whole. Um, and I, I thought, wow, there needs to be a lot of changes here. Um, but I still, I always saw the potential. I always, there was never a time um, that I looked at historical interpretation and said there was no, it was not worth saving. Um, I just felt like uh, most people had this beautiful tool that they were misusing. Um, and I see historical interpretation as, as a tool. Um, and I think in um, the wrong hands, it can, be, um, it can be very problematic or damaging to narratives. So I definitely was, um, yeah, I, I definitely, um, I definitely wanted to continue with historical interpretation. And so I started to practice and uh, we played games like, um, can you interpret, someone picks something like a pen and can you interpret it? And can you connect it with the subject? And um, I ended up being pretty good at it. And so <laughs> the rest is history. Wait a minute, so let's play a game. Can you interpret a pen? What does that mean? Give us an example of how you would interpret yeah, That's great. Right. So um, I would first say, what is this? It's a pen. But what type of pen is it? It's a stylus. Yes, it is a bootleg Apple pen. Don't tell nobody. And um, this is at the moment kind of at the height of technology right now, but let's say writing utensils have 
always been at the height of technology. If we go back 3000 years, the ability to write down what's going on in our world today is a huge deal. Um, you can now pass down knowledge from one person to the next without the knowledge shifting with storytelling. Information shifts. It can be very beautiful as it shifts when stories get jumbled up and changed. But if you're writing it down, you can't really do much but reinterpret the words. Um, and they're clearly there on the page. So simple pin, height of technology. That's just. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I think all great interpreters, um, I do this, oh, my interpreters hate this when I do that. I'm like, can you interpret this? They're like, go away. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, so I, just doing that over and over again um, until it just becomes like second nature um, to talk to people about random things because um, it's easy to memorize a skit or a, not a, it's not easy to remember a skit and perform it. Let me be very clear. I am a terrible actress. Actors and actresses are amazing. <laughs> I don't have those skills, but it's easy to just wrote memories, memorize something that you recite, but it's really hard to um, be ready and willing, whatever people throw at you at any time in any space to be able to have a conversation and, um, and connect it with history and broader ideas. So I think that's something that I love doing. It sounds like yeah. fun. <laughs> it is and, and in a very good way so can you talk a little bit more about what keeps you going in this field especially because earlier you mentioned you know you do have to deal with the reality of the pain that was experienced in the past uh, and also in the present when you're interpreting so what keeps you going as a living historian and an interpreter um i really to be honest, the anger at the injustice that my ancestors suffer, that my family members suffer today, that I have suffered, and that keeps me going. I turn the frustration and anger um, at the, a whole system that we are crying out for justice and equality and and help and people are just like you know you could just work harder and or you know I, I think it's just in in your head you just really want to be uh, oppressed uh, and so I turn all that into all that frustration and anger um, into my work. Um, and it, that's what keeps me going. And I keep, um, because I am very frustrated and appalled that um, the ancestors were treated thus and that their names are continued to be um, misused and re misrepresented. And um, I will not stop until, um, I write as many things as I can get my hands on. Um, that's just every day. Every time I see something, I'm like, must keep going, <laughs> must keep going. Because there are, um, it's very, it's very tough. It is very tough emotionally, uh, mentally. Uh, and that's why I, um, I have to keep my mental health with me. I have to keep, you know, healthy. And I have to, like, for one thing, uh, up until um, last week, I had never been on a real vacation. Never. Um, in my adult life. So I 
when I was a kid, of course, I went on vacation with my parents, but in my adult life, I never been on a vacation. And so every, every trip I took, I maximized it in how can I reach as many people as I can, go to as many sites as I can. Um, all my money went into historical garbs and to travel to historic sites and to um, going into schools and uh, supporting the social studies. So, um, but I really starting to realize I also need to take care of myself because um, if I'm not here <laughs> to continue on. Also, I think the biggest revenge um, is to have me still here just keep keep pumping away at this so um i think that's the biggest revenge i can uh, make out for the um for the ancestors let me Last just night I was... as a follow-up i want to just say <laughs> kind of you go as a follow-up let me just say if if it is if it is at all helpful for your um, audience, us, to show support to you, if that helps keep you going. I'd like to ask everyone who's watching this video, follow Chaney on all of her social media. And when she posts something that you like or makes a video and uploads it that you like, comment, well done. Just comment with a heart, just comment, just to give her a little bit of fuel to keep going because she's right. This is, this is a emotionally draining work that she does. And I'm so proud of her for being able to do it because a lot of people I know don't have the energy management skills to do that. So anything you can do to help fuel this amazing historian, please do. Thank you. And uh, it, it, it matters. So I have, I keep all of the positive feedback, even the constructive uh, criticism. And I, I screenshot them and I put them into a folder on my phone. And so there are times where I have really hard times and I flip through and it's really helpful and it really helps me to get through um, those tough times because there are moments of like great joy. Like this week has been really amazing. It's been an outpour of support. And then it's like sparks of really exciting times with like long stretches of desert. <laughs> so um, when so when you comment um, something positive or constructive, um, it it doesn't just go into a void. Um, even though uh, sometimes I don't have the energy to respond to everyone, I'm being honest. I just don't have the res I don't have the energy to respond to everyone. But I promise you, um, your comments do get read. Um, I just you know to preserve my um, mental health. I just, you know, I have to limit, um, you know, how many I respond back to. On YouTube, comment more than three words because that helps engagement. Anything under three words, like art, YouTube is like, eh. But if you comment more than three words, YouTube will decide that her video is slightly more important and push it out to even more people, which is the goal. And I think that's really with this with this video, a lot of people have been commenting. So, yeah, uh, I did want to tell you a story that last night I was out for my walk because my husband and I walk in the middle of the night um, to avoid other humans. <laughs> and uh, I was telling him about you and I told him what you did for a living and he was silent for 10 minutes afterwards. And to silence my husband is a difficult task. So I want to give you props for that. And then he just said, wow, that must be hard. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, I think I, I actually went back to Williamsburg this past week, Colonial Williamsburg. And it was just very interesting um, seeing where I was now and when I left Colonial Williamsburg, and um, I was a mess when I left. Um, I was so, I was so beaten down, and um, I, I, I'm just very glad that I was able to kind of pull myself together and continue on. 
um, because I think a lot of people, a lot of Black interpreters walk away after experiences like that. And I don't, I don't blame them at all. I don't blame them at all. Um, it was just, I don't know, I guess I'm a glutton for pain. Yeah. Well, that like leads us right into the next question, which is what would you like to see improve in the living history community? <laughs> um, and I would say in like professional uh, living history, I really, really want to see more sites developing specialized support programs for uh, Black interpreters. Our job is different. Um, so wherever we are, I find in North America, Black folks in living history, our job's just different. Um, and we, we need different support. Uh, different supports from from uh, from organizations. So I would just say that that's one of the main things I would love to see: just better support for Black interpreters. And on the hobby side, I really want um, oh, there's a lot, uh, but mainly I I would just want uh, hobbyists when you are developing programming uh, and you want Black folks to attend, uh, you need to be building in interpretation from the, from the ground up. So um, I find that a lot of times with reenactors and um, living history people on the hobby side, they kind of sprinkle in Black people at the end, kind of as like a, a more historically accurate topping to make it seem like their events more um, more accurate. And um, so I, I really want uh, more reenactors to just um, bring in people, Black people in the planning stages um, and not just kind of throw us in at the end because we're kind of getting wise to that. And that's why there are less and less Black people at uh, reenactments. I just, um, I think you can usually get one of the newbies to come um, to your event, but they get wise very quickly. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I don't want to be a prop. I think that's a life lesson for all things that you do in groups in life, including your company that you work at. Yes, just start out with everyone, please. Yes, more people at the table. Also, <laughs> it's like an insurance policy. Uh, you're less likely to make, you know, those easy mistakes. That are catastrophic that's sometimes. <laughs> So now that we've, you know, gone very deep, <laughs> talked about very emotional things and um, inspirational things, let's talk about something just fun in general. Um, tell us about your, like your favorite completed project. Oh, um, are you talking about um, garments or like a whole project? Either or, you get to pick. You get to pick how you answer. Um, it's all it's all on you. Oh, cool. Um, I did a um, collaboration with uh, YWCA uh, here in New York, where we got young women of color together to get them interested in living history through activism, and it was just a really wonderful program. I brought in a colleague, Jana, to help them learn how to hand sew petticoats. Um, people donated fabric, it lit, beautiful linen fabric. Uh, it was awesome. Um, I, they also came up with a modern day protest um, based off of a protest of the past. So they picked the, um, the silent march 
uh, in um, 1917, I believe. So they picked the uh, silent march um, that was put on by the uh, NAACP and um, the NAACP at the beginning of the 20th century. And basically the women were wearing all white um, and they were carrying signs and they were just silent. And so they were protesting lynching and they took that and they decided to wear all white. And it was really amazing. And all they, all I did was uh, source the, the clothing for them and um, they came up with what they were going to put on the signs and I got it printed up someplace and I was, I was so freaking proud of these women, these young women. I was just so freaking proud. And um, they also then came up with a um, kind of a scene where um, they could style themselves however they wanted in 18th century clothing. It was just very interesting what they picked and they just looked so fabulous. I was just so, the whole program, I was just, I, I think that's one of the, the proudest moments. I just, out of everything that I've ever done, uh, that, that meant the most to me. Um, though I do a lot of things that I'm very passionate about, but that one just like, I, I really am hoping that I am, um, training my competition. I want there to be so many more um, Black interpreters um, that every site has a very competent uh, Black person interpreting history, uh, of a few of us at each site. So that's long-term goal. And then I would like to have a lot of freelance interpreters um, doing their thing. But we're a little ways off from that. <laughs> yeah. What is the silliest thing that's ever happened to you during an event? Oh my goodness. Okay, it's, it sounds miserable, but we, to this day, we laugh about it. Um, when I started reenacting, I would reenact with my friend, uh, Mia Marie. And there was this one time when we were at an event and earlier in the day, it had just been raining and raining and raining and the temperature started to plummet and we were portraying contraband. So we were like, oh, we'll just, you know, sleep outside and we'll be fine. <laughs> you know? um, thank goodness we had a friend who had a baby and um, she decided that she was going to take her baby to a hotel room. So she was like, I have a tent, an empty tent. Why don't you all take it? We were like, uh, we're trying to be accurate here. Um, thank goodness we took that tent <laughs> because we were so cold, okay? We were like huddled together, a blanket between us. And it was just like, I would, I, it felt like the longest night of my life. And every two seconds, me would be like, Jenny, what, what time is it? And I was like, it's only been two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the coldest. And now we can look back and just laugh on it. Um, and there's just a lot of funny business that goes on at reenactments. Um, I may say things about, you know, my feelings about reenactments. But I have a lot of great relationships with reenactors and from, I do have fond experiences from my time in reenacting. Um, like you, you know for a fact that you have had, you've eaten a lot of bugs in your life if you're a reenactor, cause there's no way that you can cook outside um, or even have, like we have cooked ribs just over the fire and so you've eaten all types of dirt and bugs and stuff so <laughs> it's like a moment where um before reenacting picking off a burnt bug off the off your meat and then still continuing to eat the meat like 
what? <laughs> I think that's the craziest thing. You got it. <laughs> Yeah, you gotta eat. You know, when I think back, I'm like, <laughs> so it just desensitized me a lot to, I have a very high threshold for like food safety. <laughs> Anyone here who's totally grossing out should go Google the concept. Uh, there, in every food item that is on the shelf of your grocery mm -hmm. store, there is a maximum bug, bug count allowed. There is. Which means, that is a non-zero number. <laughs> so funny. You know, I love it. <laughs> I, I think I might be, I think I might be the same age as Noel. I'm not sure if I'm older than you, Cheney. I'm 43. And I remember Arsenio Hall as a teenager would do that, do a, a bit during his intro, mm -hmm. his intro monologue to his show. He would, he would read off like how many bug parts could be in a can of green beans, for instance. And so it was at that That's moment. That's how I know this. Right. Is I used to love that. <laughs> you're like Ooh. as a germaphobe he really ruined a lot of things for me i have i have grown a lot since then i am able to still eat green beans but i was traumatized <laughs> i love it because <laughs> i i think my first reenactment i was like i am not eating that i think by the second day i was so hungry i i was eating <laughs> the first day you're like oh this looks just awful uh, I will never be eating any of this. <laughs> right? And then because after walking like, miles. They're thawing out stuff outside. You're like, is this, am I going to get like salmonella poisoning? Like, I don't know. Are you bleaching things in between you? Like you're just laying utensils down on a dirty table. Like I was very much upset at the situation, but you're right. Yes. Like, a couple days outside and you're hungry. You're like, okay, I'm going to eat this. Right, right, right. Like get a little bit hungry. Oh, you will eat a lot of things that you said you would never eat. <laughs> and I, I also, I have family members who, um, you know, some of my family members are very country. So um, I used to say things like, I've never had squirrel before. And um, a cousin of mine was like, yes, you do. You had squirrel last night. <laughs> It's just different meat. It's fine. It is. It's delicious. It's Once yeah. you get over it, it's it's okay. <laughs> so do you have um, like a sentimental or nostalgic memory to share with us from eventing or doing interpretation? Uh, yes. The very first, what I consider the first Sons and Daughters of Ham. So Sons and Daughters of Ham is a uh, Black living history group um, of living historians who interpret um, contraband, so Civil War contraband, those are enslaved persons during the Civil War who liberate themselves by running to Union lines. And so they helped out um, whether it was things like laundry, ditch digging, railroad repairs, um, um, driving carts. There's all types of things that they, jobs that they were doing um, in exchange for kind of um, protection from being sent back to their enslavers. Um, so the Sons and Daughters of Ham, we kind of informally started at the reenactment in Bentonville. And I think that that was the, I have to say, I think that's the best ever impression I've ever seen. Um, I know I, I should be more humble, but I just, I'm so proud of my colleagues. We came through as contraband. I'm sure you've seen the pictures. Um, and we came through and we looked actually like contraband moving through union camps in the middle of like the, the late fall. It was just a really, it was a really amazing experience that um, it's so, it's it will forever be in my heart also because it was just kind of the first time we kind of realized we were a family and we clicked so well. And, you know, 
we joke around, we have very serious moments, we laugh and cry. Uh, there's inevitably a fight somewhere in the middle of it, just like any real family. Um, it is awesome. Um, and so that very first event, it will always be in my heart. That's really sweet. So speaking of what organizations are you in? Um, so it's not a lot. Um, Sons and Daughters of Fam. I think I am a member of Alfam. Um, I think it's the African American Museum Alliance as well. Um, also, uh, National Association of Interpretation. I think. I think that's oh, uh, Nickmer in New York City. Yeah. I think that's it. But I'm sure I'm, you know. Once you're, once you get into uh, museum fields, there are just so many organizations. There's like regional, and then there's international, and there's national. Um, so that's what I can think of off the top of my head. What events do you recommend to uh, new or existing living historians or costumers to get into? Frederick's um, Market Fair. I think that's a good source to kind of hang out and meet new people. Um, I would also say, of course, I Black interpreters, if you're interested in mid 19th century, uh, think about um, trying out for Sons and Daughters of Ham. Um, sometimes we're looking for new members, so um, reach out to us. We have a, a Facebook group. So Sons and Daughters of Ham usually does uh, events at Harper's Ferry. Uh, so we interpret that contraband camp there. And it's just a very beautiful event, beautiful scenery, content rich. Um, you will definitely find something to interpret. And it's really nice to have, there's a lot of experienced interpreters. For some reason, we decide to on the weekend off from our day jobs, do our day jobs <laughs> on the weekend as well for, uh, <laughs> for, <laughs> for that program. Uh, so absolutely that. So who is your costumer crush or living historian crush? Do you have one? <laughs> that is so funny. Um, I will say, I'm, I'm just gonna put objectively, some very handsome people up here. Um, I would say um, Harold at Colonial Williamsburg. Um, he is an excellent cook, uh, but he is, he at Harold Carl, Caldwell, you may kill me for this, but he is taken right now, but he is very handsome to look at. So how you doing? Um, and then I would say Joel Cook. I think he's taken two. I'm sorry, I'm I'm picking all these taken people. He is a very handsome um, historical interpreter, um, living historian. And so he does Frederick Douglass and he looks exactly like a young Frederick Douglass. Uh, so yes, he's very handsome. I'm just objectively putting some handsome people out there. And then of course, in the vintage world, someone I have a huge crush on is um, Indigenous Fatal. Like their clothing is amazing, but the energy is very, I love that energy. So I can also send you that link. That'd be fantastic, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have an entertainment routine for sewing or crafting or projecting? Do you have a playlist or um, a show list that you watch? <laughs> um, I usually, I, I'm, a, um, I'm a escapist. So I love to listen to science fiction, um, 
and apocalyptic stuff on Audible while I'm sewing. So things like, oh, that expeditionary force. <laughs> I know some people will be like, oh my gosh, but it's such, they, these are such great um, audio books. And I think I've listened to 12 of those books by now. So I love it. Um, and there's a, there's a kind of a list of, of science fiction that I listen to on Audible. And I, I, I love that. I love storytelling. And I find that that's kind of as far away I can get from my day job as I can. If we're, we're talking about spaceships in outer space, having space battles. <laughs> I like my Netflix. I like my HBO, um, Hulu. I cannot stop watching Handmaid's Tale, even though it traumatizes me every time. I am every so time. traumatized, but I keep watching it because I'm like, oh, what's happening to her now? I keep sitting there like under the covers being like, and, and, and my husband's like, why do you even watch this? And I'm just like, because I got to know, like, I got to know what happened. Yeah. I gotta know, and and at one point, it got a little bit too real. It felt like a little bit too current, and I was like, I think I had to stop watching for a little bit, maybe two years ago, and I've uh, been picking it back up again. Yeah. <laughs> I will say, I just recently um, gave in and started watching Little Fires Everywhere because the algorithm had cut <gasps> heaps. Refer like you need to watch this. You need to watch. I was like, I don't want to watch. Reese with right. I don't want to watch another show with women. I don't, I don't know what I was on a kick. I was like, I don't want to watch a, a soap opera, but I started watching it. Right. <laughs> is it good? Oh my gosh. And I, it is really good. Like it's set in 97. And so I was like uh -huh. out of high school then. So it had yeah. like pop culture references that are so like they're drinking sl slim fast, right? And then they're taking the face oh off of the radio in their car. Like it was just, it's, it's like a walk down memory lane, kind of. I totally forgot about that. I need to watch, I need to watch that. Um, also, I'm obsessed with all of the Star Treks except the original. Yeah, I hate the original. I don't so ever, I can't get through it. it. It makes no sense to me, but all of these spinoffs, Mm -hmm. I love every lab Voyager, Deep Space Nine. Space Nine I uh, just and then SG One. I like um, SG uh, Atlantis. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm I'm one of those people. I because when I was younger, I watched Star Trek, so I was so even as a young kid. I'm a huge nerd. So, <laughs> all right. Speaking of, who inspires you? Hmm. There are so many artists um, that really inspire me, but I, I would have to say I draw inspiration from obviously the ancestors. Um, so reading the WPA slave narratives, um, also um, looking at what they left behind in their um, and the things that they made, such as pottery, um, clothing. But also I'm um, very passionate about hip hop and uh, poetry. I just, I'm a huge hip hop fan. I love rap um, from 1995 to modern, um, even, even there's a special place in my heart for even the um, really horrible rappers today. Like, <laughs> just, I'm like, okay, if I, you know, if you're in the club and you, you know, had a few drinks, it starts to make sense. So let's roll. Nope, and, and you know all, all that reflects into my clothing as well <laughs> sorry uh besides rap 
what are you grateful for? Who are you grateful for? Who am I grateful for? Oh, uh, my parents, um, my business partners, Jerome and Carolyn, um, my um, director of photography on these roots, uh, Moses, and of course the director, Dallas. Um, I have a amazing team around me that made everything that I'm doing now very possible. Um, there was a long time where I was unable to let go of things. And I was like, I have to do everything myself and it, it's all on my head. Um, but having a team has really changed, changed everything for me. And I, I'm just so grateful for them and that they believed in me because um, at the beginning, when I just said, this is this my vision, this is what I wanted to do. Um, they were like, sure, that totally makes sense. When I was like, are y'all sure? I'm sure you. Um, I just, I'm so happy for, and then of course, a special shout out to my cousin, Harriet. My cousin, Harriet, she's just like, my number one hype person. <laughs> like you have to have that one person <laughs> that is like <laughs> out here and Abby Cox as well. Um, my hype people out here just <laughs> cheering me on um, because I feel like sometimes I'm the little engine that could. Abby is really your hype person. Like honestly, yes. she hyped you like behind your back to all of my friends. Yes. Like. <laughs> yeah I, I mean she she's a real one like I would say um Abby from day one when I met her I caught her talking about me so, to someone being like there's this girl named Cheney she's awesome you have to meet her and I was like we just met <laughs> she, was like, she was like I know I just knew yeah. <laughs> so uh, from day one, she has just been, um, and I, I really, really appreciate it because if it wasn't for the fact that people who support me go really, really hard for me, I would not be where I am today because these are people who um, would go to historic sites specifically to tell them that they needed to hire me um, for a program. Like I have had stories of someone who follows me going to a historic site, knocking on the director's door, uh, putting a print out of my website on their desk and being like, you have to bring this person to the site. And um, that kind of support, um, it, it does something and um, it really tells people that there may be something here uh, so I, I just, I would not be here. I would not be here if it wasn't for the people in my life and if it weren't for the people who support me because they go hard, okay? They go hard. The reason why is because they recognize that there is a talent here. There's a passion here. There is a, a realness to what you want to teach. There's a power behind it that they want to support. And a lot of times these people have never seen that before done in the way that you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And so they're yeah. going hard for you because they really want to bring that that you have to everyone else. So it's a mutually yeah. beneficial situation. Yeah. I, I, I cannot say, I as someone who was, I know this is such a common story, but as someone who was kind of picked on in school and who's always kind of been on the outs to have this like kind of support it's just so um it's very, very humbling it's very I, I there are just no words there are just no words and it makes me it really makes me push harder because I'm like once you know that people believe in you and they're willing to you know send you gas money or um you know when I was having there was a time where I literally 
had no more leggings because I had put all my money into historical garb. Um, one of my followers sent me leggings so that because I was just sewing together leggings <laughs> just because you know how the crotch wears out and I would just patch stuff on it <laughs> and then, like one of my followers came to a lecture and was like <laughs> it was like I was like it was really embarrassing and I was like I can't afford I can't afford this but I do have a I do have uh historical dresses <laughs> She was like, no child, you need clothes. <laughs> I guess my, my takeaway here is to get you some friends who will print out your website hard copy and put it on people's doorsteps. <laughs> <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, because I usually ask people when they contact me, how did they hear about me? <laughs> it's like, they were like, oh, so you didn't know about this. I was, like, I did not know about this. I promise you, I am not sending people <laughs> with printouts of my website to. Um, it's just, it this means is also, just the world. It means the world. This is a life uh, lesson for everyone though. Like hype your friends. Like you can change a life here. Yes. Like, you can change someone's entire yes. trajectory by hyping your friends. Like do it. <laughs> And, it, and it's, it's those times, like, I feel like um, there were many times where I didn't know if I could continue. Like, I just didn't know if it was possible. And then maybe Abby came to town and was like, oh my gosh, that last thing you did was amazing. It really helped me understand this, 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 and this. And you have to keep going. You have to keep going. <laughs> so, or um, my cousin Harriet would pick me up from um, from the apartment, and um, she would take me out to eat when all I had was ramen at home. It was so. Um, I love Harriet. She would... I even know Harriet. I love Harriet. <laughs> right, right, cousin Harriet, shout out. <laughs> yeah. All right, do you have a favorite inspirational quote? And if so, who is it by? I think um, this is cheesy, but our previous first lady, um, they go low, you go high. Yeah. I think though, sometimes this quote is misused mm -hmm. to be like, you act like a punk. Don't let people punk you, <laughs> but you have to, you have to fight for uh, what you, what you know is right. You have to fight, but do not get in the weeds. Like there are people who want to drag you into a meaningless all out brawl in the weeds but you want to go high because you keep your you keep your brain clear. If you are thinking about, so someone said this horrible thing to me, but instead of cussing them out or punching them, take that momentum to think about how can we um, have a deeper conversation about this. Turn that into an interpretation. I love it when people now, it was hard when I started, but I love it now when people tell me really messed up stuff. When they say messed up stuff, that is the best inspiration for me. Uh, because usually I'm just like, wow, that's messed up you said that. Huh, how can I educate people using what you just said? Um, and so there's been multiple times like, for example, a day in the life, these roots, the very first episode I did because uh, someone told me that um, I did a problematic Monday where I called out myself and other people who were um, interpreting slavery for private events. And I wanted to show people 
how do you interpret slavery in a respectful way that's not for your pleasure, but is for educational purposes and for the glory of the ancestors. So it's not about me, it's about getting these stories out. And so that was such a big inspiration uh, for me. So uh, I know everyone says it, but I always, I kind of think that a lot of people use it as like a way to pacify people or, you know, they go low, you go high, which means you just, you just like suck it all in and just go out into a corner. No, they go lot, they go low, you go higher and you find a way of still educating these people. So that was, I know that's so, I think that's everyone's call right now, but. Yeah, it's, it's just all everything you need to know. Right. Everything. <laughs> so if you could give a new um, interpreter one piece of advice, what would it be? Number one, um, I would say perfect your craft. Continue to practice. As I said before, the, uh, the game we played about interpret any and everything, find other interpreters and push each other. That's one thing that I did appreciate about Colonial Williamsburg. It was an environment um, at the time where we were constantly being trained in interpretation and we were pushing each other forward to be better interpreters. We were bouncing ideas off of one another. We were critiquing each other's interpretation. I would say have, I know it's so scary for me. I have a lot of anxiety about colleagues taking my tours, but it makes you better. Um, so that's number one. Um, number two, I would always say um, fight for what's right. Um, if you're being mistreated at a site, speak up. And I know it is very scary. Uh, and, you know, uh, and be willing to walk away. Um, and I know this comes from a place of privilege because I am, I don't have children and I'm unmarried. So um, when I walked away, um, I was able to do that because I, I only had myself depending on myself. Um, but I would say, do whatever you need to do to have a savings so that if a historic site treats you wrong, when you threaten and say, I will leave if this, this, and this is not done properly, you should leave. Never threaten something that you're not willing to follow through with. Um, so basically follow, uh, sorry, fight for what, you're, uh, what you believe in and fight for what you're worth and your worth protection um, from harassment from guests um, and your worth um, in a site investing in you as an interpreter. And I would say for all the costumers watching, those uh, bits of advice would work for a new historical costumer as well. You know, don't fight for your own, use your own agency. Know your craft, learn yes. as you can, and don't don't allow an organization to mistreat you or people in an organization. Yes. Yeah. Also, especially if you're not BIPOC, don't let people in your organization mistreat others. Like it's not just for you. <laughs> Protect those around you and be willing to follow through on your threats for that too. Right. Because that's where you show your colors. So all righty if you have a closing message of inclusion and equity and you would like to send it out please do there are times where this job is very very hard um, for people of color um, and 
for LGBTQIA in this field. And I really, I really want you to know that, you know, there are resources out here. There are other interpreters. It is the year 2021 of our Lord and you can find support. If your site is not supporting you, call me, <laughs> okay? Uh, I think there should be like, you know, the, uh, the bat light for the Batman light that they put up in the sky. They should have a not your mama's history light because <laughs> I will be there. <laughs> so let me know. Um, I think um, you are your, um, you are everything you need to get through interpretation, uh, to collect all the data you need. And I'm rooting for you. You can do it. And we need more people like you um, in these spaces. Uh, so keep fighting and support one another. I cannot tell you how important it has been to have community and people who will support me. And once you make it, reach back and grab somebody else and pull them up with you. Um, thank you so much for watching and um, make sure you reach out to me uh, if you need help. All right. So thank you so much for joining us today, Chaney. Um, it was lovely to get to know you a little bit better and allow other people to get to know you through our conversation. Um, thank you also to our viewers for joining us today. We will leave a list of Cheney's information below for you to go follow her on all of her platforms. Make sure you comment more than three words on all of her platforms. Also, please give this video a thumbs up if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't. And if you have a costumer of color that you think we should interview, please use the form that we insert in the description box below so that we can uh, figure out what the demand is. Make sure to leave a love, little love for Janie in the comments as well. And we'll see you guys next time with another one. Bye, guys. Bye.